Appropriations Subcommittee on Labor, Health, Human Services, Education, and Related Agencies uh, will come together. I'm glad to be here this morning with my colleagues, some of whom are joining us from their offices or from some other location. This is the first appropriations hearing being held in person and virtually, and want to thank uh, Chairman Shelby and his staff for letting us try this and see how this kind of information gathering works uh, for appropriators. Uh, it's not a markup. There will be no voting today, but we're going to get some really uh, important uh, information. Yesterday, the new coronavirus cases passed 50,000 for the first time, making it a single-day record. This morning, 128,000 Americans have died and nearly 2.7 million have tested positive for COVID V. And of course, the thoughts of myself and everyone on this committee are with those individuals and those families who've been affected. Uh, I've called this hearing really to look at an update on uh, the efforts that the administration's put together. And, and frankly, members of this committee were very involved in to see if we couldn't establish a new way to look at responding uh, to pandemic, uh, I think we have the chance to actually write a new important chapter in what that response looks like. Uh, developing the right vaccine, the right therapeutics, uh, the, the right testing is important. And I think we're going to talk today about ways uh, to try to have all of the safeguards in developing all of those things but with a federal partner uh, going forward more quickly than we would have ever gone forward today. I saw uh, in reporting this morning that uh, Pfizer is uh, just in, passed an important mark with the vaccine they're working on. Uh, maybe the most uh, significant thing I saw in that article was uh, that Pfizer believes they may have 100 million doses of that vaccine available by the end of the year. That would be an extraordinary thing if it happens. And I think what we're gonna hear from our witnesses today uh, is that uh, there are other companies that would be developing uh, different vaccines that also would add to that, uh, that figure that might be available late this year or early next year. I think the administration's willingness to take this new initiative uh, the willingness of the administration and, frankly, our Appropriations Committee and the, the Congress uh, in what we did in the last COVID Act to put some money uh, behind taking a chance, uh, not a chance with an effective vaccine or test, but a chance that uh, we may move forward with something that doesn't work, uh, more to uh, also allow us to move forward early with something that does work. This committee, uh, the full committee, and the, and the Congress has provided nearly $10 billion for uh, this overall effort, and the vast majority of this investment will support the research and development of vaccines and treatments. There are over 100 vaccines in development worldwide. Uh, Operation Warp Speed, I believe, is beginning to focus in on about seven that would they that we would encourage the advancement of into clinical trials and further development. Importantly, as NIH and the Biomedical Advanced Research Development Authority continue to oversee the development of these vaccines, uh, we're also going to be talking today about how manufacturing, uh, for maybe the first time ever, uh, would begin while the vaccine is still going through the other process and maybe while tests are still going uh, through the other process. As we saw earlier this year uh, with diagnostic testing research at NIH, the current processes can be streamlined to make them faster. Just because something is new doesn't mean it's better, but this is a time uh, to try things and to see what we can figure out to make work. Under the NIH's Shark Tank program, program that uh, particularly Senator Alexander and I spent a lot of time uh, talking to people at this table about, principally Dr. Collins, but people at this table, manufacturers, and others. We're hoping to fast-track diagnostic tests, to have tests that are easier to take with a quicker response that, frankly, millions of people can take dozens of times. Getting school started in the fall 
at residential campuses and elementary and secondary schools uh, and all other campuses, having a test available uh, will make a big difference. Uh, some people uh, have warned that the timetable to develop both tests and vaccines next year is far too fast. Others have said, well, maybe accelerating the process uh, means that regulatory corners will be cut. We're going to be working really hard to be sure that is absolutely not the case, and I think our leaders here today uh, will help reassure us of what they're doing to see that that uh, doesn't happen. This is an opportunity for our witnesses to explain uh, to our committee and the American people how uh, the development process works, how they'll ensure that the vaccine will be safe, and even with an accelerated research and development timetable, how the vaccine will be distributed across the country as quickly as possible. Uh, I've said to several pe people lately on the topic of vaccine and distribution that obviously developing the vaccine is the top priority, but right below that top priority is having a plan uh, that distributes that vaccine in a way that people believe is fair and equitable uh, and meets the standards that we should be establishing uh, right now. There are clearly concerns about uh, the vaccine. About half of Americans are either reluctant, uh, about one out of five Americans says they're just not going to take the vaccine. Uh, I, I certainly intend to, uh, and um, I think uh, most Americans will. And uh, as we reassure people about this process, they'll also think about smallpox and polio and other things uh, that in many cases vaccines have been able to move outside the system because vaccines did their job and you know kids in the fourth and fifth grade don't line up any longer so that every single person uh, takes their smallpox shot like they did when most of us were kids. Um, I hope today's hearing uh, really makes an impact on those concerns. I believe it will uh, and uh, look forward to our witnesses. Uh, Senator Murray is uh, here, and I'm going to recognize her for her opening statement. Senator Murray, thanks for being with us today, and thanks for working together to have this hearing. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I really want to thank you and Chairman Shelby for allowing our committee members to participate in this hearing virtually today. And I want to thank all of our committee staff for setting everything up, and I want to thank all of our witnesses who are joining us today as well. Your agencies play a critical role in the development of some of the most important tools against the COVID-19 pandemic, safe and effective diagnostics to identify the cases, therapies to help patients and frontline workers fight this disease, and ultimately a vaccine to move towards ending this crisis. That is why Congress has appropriated more than six and a half billion dollars to BARDA and three billion to NIH for work on medical countermeasures against COVID-19. And we know we'll need more funding, particularly to distribute and promote a safe, effective vaccine down the line. And we also know we're gonna to need to hold this administration accountable to avoid repeating mis mistakes and delays. The Trump administration put politics ahead of public health by promoting unproven treatments and steering PPE contracts to unqualified political allies. They failed to plan in a comprehensive way for nationwide challenges like scaling up testing and contact tracing and ignored and exacerbated existing health disparities that left black, Latino and tribal communities to face the worst of this crisis. If we wanna get out of this mess anytime soon, the Trump administration has to do better particularly when it comes to developing a safe, effective vaccine that is widely available. What I hear from experts is that while we all want a vaccine fast, a vaccine that is fast but ineffective will fall short, fall short of what is needed to turn the tide on this pandemic. That is why it is more than concerning that the Trump administration sidelined our leading scientists at CDC, removed the head of BARDA, reportedly for putting science and public health over allegiance to President Trump, and took BARDA experts off leadership of contracts related to the search for a COVID-19 vaccine. I also have concerns about why BARDA has chosen to invest 
solely in new vaccine technologies that have only been studied experimentally and never made it to market while not pursuing older proven technologies. Meanwhile, the administration still has not provided any explanation of how it is selecting vaccine candidates, what the risks are of narrowing down that shortlist, or addressed concerns about potential conflicts in contracts that predate this crisis. And it still has not provided a comprehensive national vaccine plan. We saw with testing how the administration's stubborn, stubborn refusal to plan led to totally avoidable delays. So Congress clearly needs to act to hold President Trump accountable when it comes to vaccines or risk another inadequate plan that offers too little, too late, or worse, no plan at all. That's why I am working on a proposal to require the Trump administration to provide a comprehensive plan for how it will make sure we get a vaccine that is safe and effective, produced at scale and distributed nationwide and free and available to everyone in a way that addresses the health disparities this pandemic has made worse. This plan has to ensure that research and development is rigorous, science-driven and inclusive, and it must lay out specific standards, timelines and milestones a commitment to be fully transparent about the clinical trial data experts will use to evaluate safety and effectiveness and strategies for combating vaccine hesitancy and misinformation. When we finally develop a vaccine, we will need to safely manufacture, manufacture hundreds of millions of doses for the US alone and billions globally as fast as possible. And that means just as many specialized glass vials syringes, stoppers, and a lot more. Making all of that happen requires planning to manage the supply chain and, chain and navigate challenges like potential bottlenecks. We also need a plan for when we begin to distribute vaccines, to guide critical decisions about who gets the vaccine first, like frontline healthcare workers, high-risk groups, and tackles barriers that could otherwise limit access by making sure the vaccine is free for everyone and addressing health disparities, which have already made this crisis so much worse for communities of color. And while we need this plan as soon as possible, we also need to be clear about what scientists and clinicians have cautioned, which is that while there is no guarantee a vaccine will be ready by the end of this year, much less by this fall, there are people suffering with COVID-19 right now who need proven therapeutics to help them beat this disease. While a vaccine is our best hope for stopping this virus, it is not our only means of fighting it, nor is it a panacea on its own. So I'm alarmed that while this administration has invested heavily in vaccine development, it is treating other priorities as an afterthought by investing far less in better diagnostics that can identify infections early in the course of the illness and prevent further spread, and pulling the plug on therapeutics that could provide life-saving relief for hospitalized patients at the greatest risk of dying or suffering long-term health effects. Congress provided funding for HHS to invest in a spectrum of medical countermeasures to fight this virus, not just vaccines, we need to invest in every type of medical countermeasure and to do it in a way that benefits everyone in our country equitably, because we know right now this virus is disproportionately impacting communities of colors. For months now, I have been pressing for comprehensive demographic data on access to testing, positive test results, hospitalizations, intensive care unit admissions, and fatalities. And I'm frustrated that we don't have all the data we need yet, but the picture we do have is alarmingly clear. People in the Black community, Latino community, and tribal communities are three to five times more likely to be hospitalized for COVID-19 than white people. And the death rate for people of color is two to three times that for white people. Those devastating health disparities are a symptom of a larger pattern of systemic racism and underinvestment in communities of color, and a warning that we need to work as fast as possible on an additional relief package to
to address those disparities before they get worse, to protect our workers, our students, our families, and continue to support our communities as they fight this historic crisis. We can't know exactly how long until a safe, effective vaccine is widely available or how long before we can all safely go back to work, back to school, greet our friends with a handshake or a hug. But we do know that the decisions that we make today, whether we prioritize science or not, whether we plan ahead or not, whether we care for every community or not, will make a huge difference in terms of where we are a year from now. So it's absolutely critical we get this decision right. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. I look forward to the testimony and to our questions today. Well, thank you, uh, Senator Murray. Uh, we've got a great panel today, Dr. Francis Collins, the uh, director of the National Institute of Health, uh, Dr. Robert Redfield, the director of the Center for Disease Control, uh, Dr. De Gary Dispro, who's the acting uh, director of the Biomedical Advanced Research and Development Authority, usually referred to as BARDA. This is uh, Dr. Dispro's first time to testify, but our other two witnesses have been before this committee uh, many times, and it's possible that Dr. Collins may have set the record as a witness uh, before this committee. But Dr. Collins, why don't you start? We have your, your uh, statements. Let's try to limit your opening comments to five minutes each, and you can do that however you want to, but we're glad all three of you are here, and as you can tell, we're eager to ask questions. Well, thank you, and good morning, Chairman Blunt and Ranking Member Murray and distinguished subcommittee members. I want to thank you for your sustained commitment to the National Institutes of Health. It has enabled NIH to be at the forefront of research to address the COVID-19 public health emergency. I'm grateful for this opportunity to update you on that work. You should have at your place, or if you're on uh, the video connection, maybe an electronic version of a couple of images that I want to point you to in a moment. Over the last six months, COVID-19 has spread around the world with frightening speed. To respond to this crisis, we need to find answers to many urgent questions about how to diagnose, treat, and prevent this disease. At NIH, it is our mission to help find those answers using the best science and technology in the world. A critical question is to understand what we are up against. When it comes to new infectious diseases, knowledge is power. And as you can see on the uh, image on page two of your handout, and also in this 3D printed model that I brought along with me, which happily was not confiscated by the security people when I entered the building, even though I guess you could say I brought virus uh, to your hearing room. This one will not cause you illness. Uh, this model shows you the cause of COVID-19. It's this coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2. Note the distinctive array of these spiky proteins on its surface. When the virus invades the human body, these spike proteins literally open the door to infection. They act as keys that fit into specific locks on the surface of cells. And once inside the cell, the virus takes over its machinery, begins replicating, producing thousands of viruses like itself, and goes on to infect other cells. This can cause severe pneumonia, blood clots, and other life-threatening complications. Now, based on hard work, we now have better means of treating COVID-19 than just a few months ago. Remdesivir and dexamethasone have proven beneficial in rigorous trials and are now standard of care for hospitalized patients. But we have much more to do. Let me say something about testing. Testing in the U.S. has come a long way. More than 30 million tests for presence of the virus have been administered in the last few months, more than in any other nation. Yet these tests, most of which rely on nasopharyngeal swabs, and processing in centralized labs are not entirely satisfactory for the needs at hand. Scaling to rapid routine point of care testing would be a major advantage, but that requires new technology. With that in mind, Congress on April 25th provided additional resources for development of new COVID-19 tests. Just four days later, NIH launched the Rapid Acceleration of Diagnostics or RADx initiative, and if you turn to the next page, You'll see there uh, an a innovation funnel, which includes a shark tank component. Uh, this basically is an opportunity uh, for those who've invested and invented uh, new kinds of technologies uh, to put their ideas forward and have them evaluated by a distinguished team of business, engineering, technology, and scale-up experts. 
In just two months, we have received more than 2,400 expressions of interest and over 560 completed applications, most of these from small businesses. Uh, many of these proposed tests use convenient samples like saliva, which would be better than a nasal swab because you could self-collect. Of these, 23 have already made it through the shark tank and are undergoing intense validation in what you see here as phase one, preparing for possible massive scale up in phase two, and we expect to have at least one of these technologies into phase two within the next week. By fall, we expect that the winning technologies will make it possible to deploy several million more tests each week. In fact, I would say maybe more than a million more each day. But it's not enough to diagnose the disease. We must treat it as soon as possible to prevent it. To that end, on your next page, you'll see NIH has launched the Accelerating COVID-19 Therapeutic Interventions and Vaccines. That will be an acronym, ACTIV, A-C-T-I-V, initiative. This initiative uh, is shown here, and the handout provides a high-level overview of the organization of this remarkable and unprecedented public-private partnership involving 18 biopharmaceutical companies, academic experts, and multiple federal agencies. In two short months, ACTIV has developed five master protocols that will accelerate research trials and hasten FDA review and possible approval. These will rigorously test a series of antivirals, anticoagulants, immunomodulators, and monoclonal antibody treatments in both inpatient and outpatient settings. Supported by Operation Warp Speed, we expect four treatment trials to get underway in the next six weeks, and we're quite excited about their potential for success. But still, the ultimate tool we need to end the COVID-19 pandemic is a vaccine. Operation Warp Speed and the Active Initiative are working together intensively on vaccine development. A scientific review of more than 50 candidates has already been conducted. The furthest along in U.S. testing, shown on page five, is an experimental vaccine from NIH's Vaccine Research Center in partnership with Moderna. This vaccine features a small, non-infectious snippet of messenger RNA. Uh, <coughs> injecting this MRA into muscle spurs a person's own body to make the viral spike proteins, which in turn will encourage the production of protective antibodies against SARS-CoV-2. A phase two clinical trial of this vaccine candidate began on May 29th, and this month we plan to launch a phase three clinical trial that will seek to enroll 30,000 volunteers with results expected in a few months. So clearly, we've already learned much about this devastating virus, and we've made significant strides at unprecedented speed in developing diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines. Yet far more work is needed to end this global health crisis. With your support, NIH is on the case. So thank you for this opportunity, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Collins. Dr. Redfield. Good morning, Chairman Blunt, Ranking Member Murray, and members of the subcommittee. I'm pleased to be here today with my HHS colleagues. <clears throat> Together we are working on the critical issues related to COVID-19 vaccine development, manufacturing, and distribution under the auspices of Operation Warp Speed. Vaccines are one of public health's greatest scientific achievements. With the support of Congress, investments in CDC's domestic and global immunization programs continue to diminish disease threats, and advance the human condition. Most importantly, vaccines save lives. Preparing for the implementation of the safe, effective COVID-19 vaccine program is a, is a critical next step. Through our existing influenza vaccine program, CDC continues to work with state, tribal, local, territorial health partners to prepare and maintain public health distribution pipeline. This includes training personnel, building strategic relationships, utilizing data systems, identifying the resources to sustain an efficient and effective immunization infrastructure. Leveraging the existing system, CDC stands ready to support our partners with the distribution once a COVID vaccine is available. Each year, CDC safely distributes vaccine from manufacturers to nearly 40,000 public and private health providers across the nation, and in a typical year, we provide vaccine for more than 80 million individuals. During an emergency, this system has the ability to scale and in capacity to manage and distribute up to 900 million vaccine doses. This is possible because CDC has established an extensive integrated network, inclusive of public health departments, health providers, and community-based groups uh, that extend far and wide. 
Drawing on the lessons from 2009 H1N1 pandemic, we've identified critical considerations for rapid deployment of a new COVID vaccine. Distribution strategies will be based on many factors. One strategy likely will be prioritizing who is vaccinated. The goal is to ensure that vaccine access for all Americans who could benefit from vaccination. To do this, we must consider the logistical aspects of where vaccines are administered and who's administering. Monitoring systems will be required to document vaccination, manage inventory, and gauge vaccine supply nationwide. CDC currently manages the supply through its vaccine order system and collects vaccine coverage data from jurisdictions to help them make informed decisions. CDC's Immunization Safety Office has a long-standing history of monitoring the safety and efficacy of vaccines and will continue to provide leadership in this area. Scientifically based vaccine policies are the foundation of the U.S. immunization system. These policies are formulated by recommendations from the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practice, or ACIP, and then provided to me as CDC director. Another key component is the efficient distribution strategy to ensure that people um, have clear and accurate and ample information on vaccines so they can make informed decisions about getting vaccinated. Experience has shown us that vaccines are powerful tools and reaching every individual who could benefit from immunization is an important goal. A successful vaccine program will require a combination of traditional and new innovative approaches to how to administer and deliver vaccines. Pharmacies and other complementary community locations will be more important during our response to this pandemic. And finally, public health considerations have to look at the management of the vaccine itself. Every vaccine has requirements for storage and handling that must be addressed for the vaccine to be effective when delivered. Ensuring the cold chain, the system that maintains the vaccine's integrity from when it's manufactured to when it's administered. To meet these aggressive goals, it's gonna be important to enhance our nation's cold chain infrastructure. In the coming months, we will be confronted with the confluence of COVID-19 and seasonal flu. CDC is working to encourage the Americans to embrace flu vaccination with confidence. This is an important public health goal and serves two important purposes for COVID-19. First, increasing flu vaccine coverage can reduce the strain on our health system, which we've already seen in some areas um, from COVID-19. Second, the flu vaccine uptakes another opportunity to test our systems and infrastructure that will need to be leveraged uh, during a COVID-19 vaccine delivery program. As we confront to fight the pandemic, it's important that all Americans have confidence in all vaccines. Through the CARES Act, CDC was provided $140 million in funding to support states and local departments for early planning of the flu influenza season and to enhance these immunization programs across our nation. COVID-19 is the most significant public health challenge that our nation has faced in more than a century. In the absence of vaccine and countermeasures today, we are implementing effective public health measures and encouraging the adherence to what I've referred to as the powerful weapons of social distancing, face coverings, and hand hygiene. In doing so, I'm confident, confident that we will emerge from this pandemic united together stronger than ever. I encourage you to see the possible as both the public and private sectors pursue a vaccine and that we as a nation confront this pandemic globally. Thank you and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Dr. Redfield. Dr. Dispro. Chairman Blunt, Ranking Member Murray and distinguished members of this committee, thank you for the opportunity to testify today. I want to highlight how BARDA is supporting efforts to develop vaccines, treatments and diagnostics in response to the COVID-19 pandemic. BARDA is a unique government organization created to bridge the valley of death between basic research and late-stage development of products, vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics, collectively called medical countermeasures, to address 21st century health security threats. In its brief 13-year existence, BARDA has formed over 300 industry partnerships and supported products that have received 55 FDA approvals. BARDA staff are experts in government contracting and in pharmaceutical and diagnostic development, many with over 25 years of experience working in the pharmaceutical uh, industry. BARDA has a track record of success in delivering effective medical countermeasures in response to public health emergencies. Past examples include H1N1, Ebola, and Zika. 
BARTA has unique authorities allowing my organization to leverage and rapidly expand partnerships to push candidates forward to the review, testing, and approval phase. BARTA's longstanding expertise in accelerating the advanced research and development of candidate diagnostics, therapeutics, and vaccines is a testament to this dedicated and experienced team. I want to thank my BARTA colleagues as they work long hours and weekends to support this response. In a typical fiscal year, BARTA's highly experienced contracting professionals invest approximately $1.6 billion to support the development of MCMs to address chemical, biological, radiological, and nuclear threats and pandemic influenza. This year, in addition, in just three months, we have obligated over $3.5 billion as part of the COVID-19 response. BARTA has leveraged funds provided under the CARES Act and additional funds from HHS to invest in multiple vaccine candidates, multiple therapeutic programs, and multiple diagnostics. Twelve diagnostics have been granted emergency use authorization by the FDA. The BARTA COVID-19 portfolio now supports over 40 projects. When HHS Secretary Azar declared a public health emergency in January, BARTA immediately responded. As for BARTA established an interagency call with industry, highlighting our high-level strategy for the development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics to address COVID-19, attracting over 1,500 participants. That same day, BARTA opened a medical countermeasure portal to accept medical market research submissions from stakeholders receiving over 3,300 submissions to date. Prior to receiving supplemental funds, BARTA modified our two solicitations to allow for submissions of COVID-19 specific products. To date, we have received over 267 submissions under our Broad Agency Announcement, or BAA, and 426 to our Easy BAA, a streamlined solicitation with a cap of 750,000 in funding. This is what we do. We engage innovative stakeholders, establish partnerships, develop medical countermeasures, and bring them forward to the American people to save lives. Early in the COVID-19 outbreak, BARTA developed our strategy for medical countermeasure development. For vaccines, our strategy was to engage with vaccine manufacturers, developing different platform technologies, some already licensed by the FDA or nearing licensure, and who had established manufacturing processes to quickly manufacture large quantities of vaccine. Our therapeutic strategy was similar, invest in multiple technologies and to increase our chances of success. For diagnostics, our strategy was to invest in multiple technologies, molecular, antigen, and antibody-based tests. Prior to the first COVID supplemental, BARTA made initial investments in the development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics using our existing funding and authorities. This early strategy has partially served as the basis for Operation Warp Speed Strategy, or OWS. OWS is an unprecedented collaboration between the Department of Health and Human Services and the Department of Defense to expedite development of vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics and bring them to the American people. OWS aims to deliver up to 300 million doses of safe and effective vaccines for COVID-19 in early 2021 as part of a broader strategy to accelerate the development, manufacturing, and distribution of COVID-19 vaccines, therapeutics, and diagnostics for the American people. BARTA is a key component of OWS along with various NIH institutes, the CDC, and DOD. The primary goal of OWS is to develop safe and effective medical countermeasures. As a USG effort, we will need to take financial risks to expedite the development of vaccines and therapeutics. The key to success is to invest in multiple candidates and support parallel development activities to meet the expedited timelines. The risk is purely financial, a financial risk of manufacturing large amounts of medical countermeasures while we're still determining the safety and efficacy. We will not risk the safety of these products. This financial risk is necessary to ensure MCMs are available for use as soon as the FDA has deemed them safe and effective. Some of our investments will be in products that do not make it. This is the financial risk that we must take because the risk in lives lost and the impact to our economy is far greater. This committee and Congress at large have been very supportive of BARDA and our mission and we are very thankful. Today more than ever, we need your continued support and flexibility to ensure our staff can stay focused on the task at hand. I look forward to discussing how we can work together on this important issue. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Despero. We're going to do our best to stick with the five minutes that every member has. There will certainly be uh, a second round, and everybody's going to be dissatisfied at the end of their first five minutes with what they didn't get to ask, but the person that follows them will be particularly satisfied that they stayed close to the five minutes. Uh, Dr. Collins? Uh, Dr. Dispro just said we would risk no safety. There would be no product, even if produced, that would ever be available that wasn't safe. Do you have any concerns that uh, on the vaccine side that FDA is not going through every safety step that they would normally go through? 
Mr. Chairman, I have no concerns, and I'm deeply engaged in this whole process working with Operation Warp Speed. I think the ability to do things so quickly is not compromising safety. It's taking advantage of other areas where we can speed things up, even though it may involve doing manufacturing at risk when we don't know yet whether that vaccine is going to work and ultimately throw out a lot of what gets manufactured if it doesn't work. But there will be no compromise at all on the safety and the efficacy standards. That is absolutely clear. Dr. Disper, let's follow up immediately. You mentioned the risk factor, uh, and uh, Dr. Collins just said we will throw out anything that's produced that didn't doesn't go through the final certification of safety and efficacy. Uh, tell us a little more about that process. So you're, and I also noticed you said we were engaged in review, testing, and the approval phase. Are we engaged yet with anybody in the manufacturing phase? We are fully engaged with multiple companies in the manufacturing phase. Under Operation Warp Speed, we're investing in a diverse array of technologies, different technologies, because we're uncertain of which vaccine technology may produce a safe and effective vaccine. We are doing, as, as Dr. Collins mentioned, manufacturing at risk. Um, this is a risk that we have to take if we want to expedite the timeline. So there is a reason that the FDA is not part of Operation Warp Speed. They are an independent regulatory body and they will review the safety and efficacy. But we will manufacture at risk large volumes of uh, vaccine. And there is the potential that if those vaccines do not prove to be efficacious in phase three studies, uh, that we would not move forward with that vaccine. All right, every time I hear at risk, and I'm pretty comfortable with vaccines, I think, oh, somebody's hearing at risk. I think I don't think we can emphasize enough that what we're risking is losing some money that we invested to move multiple products forward so that when the, pro the products that did get through the whole process uh, would be available at maybe roughly the same time uh, they're finally approved for use. No, nothing will be more frustrating in this moment uh, than for FDA to certify a product and then here it's going to be months before that vaccine would be available. And am I right in believing that that's what you're, those months are what you're trying to avoid through BARDA? That is correct. Uh, again, under the entirety of Operation Warp Speed. But yes, BARDA is investing in multiple vaccine candidates and you are exactly right. It is a financial risk. It is not a safety risk. And we are manufacturing, um, and the government is assuming that financial risk. And I'm sure we're going to talk more about specific money later. But remember, we've already in, in, invested $3 trillion to try to fight the virus and save the economy. If somehow we lose $3 billion uh, in an effort to get both of those fights in the right place quicker, uh, I think we all ought to be willing to eagerly talk about the fact that, frankly, if we don't lose some money, we didn't try hard enough. If you choose six vaccines and they all make it, I think the question would be, well, why didn't you choose eight vaccines? Because, again, Dr. Dispro pointed out that all of these vaccines will be slightly different than the other vaccine. You, you, when you get a vaccine for COVID, and I'm, am I right in assuming that people will not all get the same vaccine, uh, for the in, in all likelihood for their their COVID uh, vaccine. So there's the potential again. We're investing in multiple candidates. We hope to develop one or more safe and effective vaccines. Uh, if there are one or more safe and effective vaccines, there is the potential um, that one vaccine may work better in a certain population uh, than the other vaccine. Um, but we will continue to evaluate those through the safety and efficacy trials, the phase three trials. And Dr. Redfield, I'm going to come back to you later on this question. But in your view. Who is responsible for the plan for distribution in the current structure? Thank you for the question, Mr. Chairman. Uh, this is really the, the center space for the CDC. As I mentioned before, we're currently involved in the distribution of a variety of vaccine programs throughout this nation. So uh, this is really the prime responsible of the CDC to work in coordination to take advantage of some of the logistical capabilities of the Department of Defense, but this is really uh, CDC's prime right. responsibility. Uh, thank you, Dr. Redfield. Uh, Senator Murray. Uh, th thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you to all of our witnesses today. Um, Dr. Redfield, this crisis, as we all know, will not end until we do have a safe and effective vaccine that can be widely and equitably distributed. 
On Tuesday, you agreed that we need a comprehensive national plan whose implementation will hinge on the ability of public health agencies to deploy a vaccine to every community once it is available. CDC's decades of experience managing a national immunization program have to be central to that planning. I think I just heard you answer Chairman Blunt, but uh, under Operation Warp Speed, does CDC lead the planning for the immunization infrastructure and distribution, or is that in any way the Department of Defense responsibility? Thank you very much for the question, uh, Senator Murray. Again, uh, it's a leveraging, we're gonna leverage uh, the logistical capability of DOD with obviously the, the experience and, and central role that we play in distribution with our state, local, tribal, territorial, community partners around the nation. So again, as I said to the chairman, this is uh, CDC's lead with the logistical support of the Department of Defense. Has the DOD ever managed vaccine distribution at this kind of scale before? I would have to refer that question to the Department of Defense, but I can just reiterate, which I mentioned, that CDC has a system in place that we use routinely. And in okay, well, I, I'm going to move on, but I, that's a question that's important here. Um, let me ask you, CDC hasn't used funding from any of the supplemental appropriations bills to prepare for a mass vaccine distribution campaign. Can you tell us why that is? I'm, I'm sorry, Senator, I didn't quite understand the, um, the uh, end of you, CDC has not used any of the funding of the supplemental appropriations bill that you've been given to prepare for a mass vaccine distribution campaign. And I want to know why that was. Yeah, Senator, I'd have to have uh, our, 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 our group get back to you, but we've, we've expended a substantial amount of the money that Congress has provided. As I know, I've moved out over $12 billion already to state, local, territory, tribal health departments to begin to augment their public health capacity. So I would need to get our team to get to the specifics of it. We moved out the $140 million that you gave us to help us the, uh, improve yeah, that, that was, influenza that vaccination. Flu, that, yeah, you've used that for flu vaccine, important, but uh, uh, the, the lack of preparation for COVID-19 vaccine distribution is concerning to me. And it doesn't sound to me like CDC is leading that effort. So, Mr. Chairman, I will move on, but I do need an answer. I think we all do to that question. Um, Dr. Dispro, last month, HHS announced a $628 million deal with Emergent Biosolutions to help manufacture the eventual COVID-19 vaccine. As the second largest award in the government's COVID-19 response, that deal cemented Emergent's dominance as the highest paid contractor for the HHS Office of the Assistant Secretary for Preparedness and Response. A Washington Post investigation revealed that before the pandemic, ASPR paid Emergent more than double what it paid any other contractor. Dr. Cadillac, who oversees ASPR, consulted for Emergent as a strategic advisor for years and was once part owner of a biodefense company with Emergent's founder and chairman a connection, by the way, that he failed to disclose to the Senate during his confirmation process in 2017. So, Dr. Disborough, this is my question to you today. Can you say with 100% confidence that companies are awarded BAR BARDA contracts based solely on scientific merit and not their personal relationship? Yes, I can. Okay, well, it was reported yesterday that three companies making coronavirus drugs and vaccines removed standard language from their contracts with BARDA that give the government, quote, marching rights to intervene in cases of unreasonable drug prices. I'm very concerned that pharmaceutical companies have dictated the terms of BARDA contracts and watered down the government's marching right protection. At a time when we are spending billions of dollars in vaccine development, why did we weaken our ability to ensure fair vaccine pricing? So I appreciate the question, Senator. So for the U.S. government to use March and rights requires a very high threshold. Um, the U.S. government can ask the uh, holder of the IP to grant a non-exclusive, partial exclusive, or exclusive license to a responsible applicant. And if that does not move forward, then the U.S. government may grant that license. However, the contractor has to show that they are not or expected to not within reasonable time achieve practical application of invention. That is not occurring. We are all working very quickly to uh, push forward with the development of vaccines and therapeutics. 
Action is necessary to alleviate health or safety needs not reasonably satisfied by the contractor. I also do not believe that threshold has been met. So again, uh, under BARTA contracts, we work under the federal acquisition regulations. We do have some contracts, uh, which are called other transactional agreements, which are outside of the FAR. Um, but we always, uh, everything is based on science and to protect the federal government's investment. Mr. Chairman, respecting time, I just want to say this. We are spending billions of dollars in vaccine development. We should not be weakening our ability to ensure fair vaccine pricing for the people of this country. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Murray. Senator, uh, Chairman Shelby. Thank you. Um, I'll, I'll address this to all three of you. Where are we today? The American people are watching this hearing. Uh, we believe that we have sent you enough money. If we haven't, tell us why not. But tell us where we exactly are, if you can be exact, uh, on coming up with a vaccine. I think the vaccine, I know you're trying every approach in the world you know, a logical approach, and uh, you got a lot of people working on it, but the American people are dying and getting sick, and they're, they're looking for results, and we know you just can't just wave the magic wand. Dr. Collins, I'll start with you. What well, do you say to the American people today of where we are and when the timeline and what do you think we will be, where? Yeah, Mr. Chairman, this is the right question and something that I think all of us working on COVID-19 are obsessed about night and day because this is one of those crises where science is not only important, it's crucial, and every mistake we make would set us back and every wasted opportunity would have a consequence for somebody's life. So I want to tell you, we are all in, everybody working on this Warp Speed team, where we are uh, with the vaccine. Remember that generally it takes five to 10 years to develop a vaccine from a new infectious agent. We don't have that time. So in record time, the very first vaccine went from knowing what the sequence of this viral genome was to injecting the first patient in a phase one trial in 63 days. That's a world record by a long shot because of new technologies that made that possible. And then going quickly from the phase one, which looks very promising, uh, to phase two, which started on May 29th, and phase three, which will begin this month. And how long will that take? We need to enroll 30,000 volunteers, and that should take a matter of some months. We are all optimistic that the goal that we have set to have a vaccine that works and is safe by the end of 2020 will be met by one of the vaccines. I've just mentioned one, but of course there's several all being conducted side by side and that we would then have, by early 2021, 300 million doses uh, of a vaccine that's safe and effective. So all of that is where we're putting ourselves on the line, and I think everybody at this table would agree that's really a stretch goal, but it's the right goal for the American people. Dr. Redfield. Thank you, thank you Chairman. Uh, two, two comments. Uh, first and foremost, the most important thing as we move forward with these vaccines, as was said before, is that uh, our role at CDC, again, along with others uh, that are here in FDA, is to ensure that they're safe and efficacious. Mm -hmm. uh, where we are right now, the two areas that we have the most important role is to figure out how to get that vaccine into the individuals that would benefit from it. So two things there, building vaccine confidence, we talked about that. But that's presupposing you come up with a vaccine, right? Yeah, I think we have to start working on that right Absolutely. now. Absolutely. We are working on that right now, Chairman, just because the complexity of giving a new vaccine to the American public, as we learned during the uh, H1N1 in 2009, it's seriously complicated. And so we are working on that, if you will, distribution mechanism now, and we were working on building the confidence in the American public now uh, with the supposition that our colleagues um, that are uh, evaluating the uh, actual vaccine itself between their seven shots on goal or as many different vaccines as they're developing now, that one of those vaccines will come and show an adequate safety and efficacy profile to go forward and be distributed. Dr. Dispo. Thank you, Senator. Uh, so building off the previous comments, I think we look at incremental success as we're moving along. I th you saw some results yesterday. Pfizer published results from a phase one clinical trial. I think those are important to get out to the American people. Initiation of phase three clinical trials. It's already been reported by one of the companies that we're working with. They will initiate their phase three trial. As Francis said, in uh, July, there will be additional phase three trials that are staggered later in the summer. I think those are important milestones to let the American people know that we are making progress. 
Uh, in addition uh, is the scale up in manufacturing and validating those process. Um, that is a critical milestone as well. So what, where we are right now is we're in the um, um, phases of the different clinical trials, phase one, phase two, phase three, and we're ramping up manufacturing. Dr. Collins, how much uh, uh, cooperation uh, around the world since so many nations and so many people are affected are uh, the researchers collaborating on and what are they getting? Science has always been an international effort and never more so than when we're faced with a global pandemic. I think the collaboration and cooperation is really excellent. One of the vaccines we're talking about actually was originally developed in the United Kingdom, has now been embraced uh, in a way that the U.S. can take advantage of it also with support uh, from BARDA's uh, a very uh, excellent way of doing those negotiations. So yeah, we are looking in every nook and cranny for the kinds of collaborations and cooperation that will make this go faster. That's our scientific tradition. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, thank you, Senator Shelby. Uh, Senator Durbin. Mr. Chairman, I want to follow up on uh, Senator Murray's question. We're in the middle of a national pandemic. We're also in the middle of a national presidential campaign. And I think her question goes to the fundamental basic uh, desire for testimony here on where we stand in terms of the political world before we address the medical world. I'd like to ask the three witnesses here if any of them have felt any pressure, political pressure, from the White House or other agencies in terms of the selection of the companies to develop a vaccine, the timing of the vaccine development, the announcement of a vaccine, or any other aspect that is part of your responsibility on the medical side? Uh, no, sir, no political pressure. Lots of internal pressure as a physician and a member of the world to try to find the answers. Dr. Redfield? Uh, Senator, my answer is no. Mr. Distro? My answer is no as well. I'm a scientist, not a politician. Thank you. That's what I was hoping for, and I think that's what the American people are looking for. And so let me go to the next question on the medical side. And here is where I think we have to have some candor. Uh, when I'm told that the phase three clinical trial of the Moderna vaccine that's being conducted by the University of Illinois at Chicago will kick off in about a week, and they anticipate that it will last years before, two years before they've completed it, collecting information from all of the people who volunteered for the test, blood samples, and the like, to determine the safety and effectiveness of that vaccine. I find it difficult to square that reality that's been announced in their phase three clinical trial with the promises that I'm hearing over and over again that within 12 months, we're likely to have a vaccine. It suggests to me that the phase three clinical trial, which ordinarily takes two years, is going to be somehow abbreviated. Now, I understand the emergency use authorization at FDA that may be utilized to choose a vaccine and go into production and distribution of such a vaccine, but that has had at least some mixed results recently when it came to the hydroxychloroquine uh, EUA that was announced. So how do we maintain the confidence of the American people of the safety and effectiveness of vaccine if it appears that we are shortcutting this uh, phase three clinical trial that is usually required in these vaccine circumstances? Senator, maybe I can help uh, explain why that two-year time interval might have been there in terms of the assessment of the vaccine. Again, what we need to know as soon as possible is, does this vaccine, when administered to people who currently are not infected but are likely to get exposed, does it protect them uh, from becoming infected? So each of the vaccine trials will aim to enroll 30,000 participants, half of whom will get the vaccine, half of whom will get a placebo. And we will watch then as these individuals, and they're gonna be particularly recruited in areas where the vaccine is currently spreading, uh, either get infected or don't. And it will only take about 126 episodes where somebody with the placebo gets infected and somebody with the vaccine doesn't to know that this has worked. That will be the point where you'd be happy to say this now has 
efficacy, and of course you'll also have a lot of people to see if there was any safety signal. The reason, though, to prolong the study after that has already been achieved is a number of other things. Are there any long-term side effects that weren't anticipated? We don't think so, but you'd want to be able to follow. And also, how durable is this particular immunity? Is this vaccine going to be something that works for life, or will you need a booster in a year or two? Hence but, the reason to extend the timetable. But, Doctor, if I'm going to make the decision, good news, 126, whatever it happens to be, in a span of three or four months, here's your vaccine. Uh, if I'm going to make that decision, what you're telling me is the phase three clinical trial still has elements, important elements in my decision-making process to be resolved, which are going to take time in terms of the long-term impact of the vaccine. Is that correct? And that is actually the way we do a lot of trials of drugs, not just vaccines, where you assess whether the drug is safe or effective in a circumstance where you really need a treatment. But then you don't stop looking once FDA has given an approval. You carry out long-term studies to make sure there's not some unexpected result or the drug stops working. So that's basically the plan here with vaccines as well. We don't want to miss the chance to collect that downstream data. Dr. Collins, are you familiar with the Cutter vaccine issued? I am. Dr. Salk and polio vaccine? Yes. Uh, can you reflect on that for a moment of what the world of vaccine development looks like today compared to then? Well, yes, that was a terrible tragedy in a circumstance uh, where a vaccine actually turned out not to be fully inactivated and therefore created actually the illness that it was supposed to prevent. I think I could reassure you and the American people that that strategy of trying to administer a killed vaccine is not currently being pursued for SARS-CoV-2 because of those risks. Instead, the vaccines choose to produce just a small component of the virus. I think I showed this before. These proteins, these spike proteins that sit on the surface, that's what the vaccine produces. There's no intact vaccine, uh, no intact virus there at all. But yet you can still generate the immunity. So the Cutter experience, which was a terrible tragedy, is really not possible with the way these vaccines are being designed. Thank you. Thank you, Senator Durbin. Senator Alexander. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you to the witnesses. We've been talking about vaccines, and next year I'd like to talk about tests and treatments and this fall, which is only a few weeks away. Let's, let's start with tests. Um, Dr. Collins, with all the depressing news we hear about uh, COVID-19 for the last several months, Americans are hungry for sports. So will there be enough COVID-19 tests so we can watch some football this fall? or some basketball this winter. I noticed the National Hockey League said it was going to test every player every day. The president of Brown University told our committee that she wanted to test every student before they come back. Admiral Juwa has said that we'll have, the country will have 40 to 50,000 test capacity by September. That will probably be enough to have widespread testing to go back to school and back to work. But will it be enough for sports teams to take the field? Probably the answer lies with your Rad X effort to make a new way of creating quick, reliable diagnostic tests that can be administered frequently, maybe even every day. So we'll be able to watch some football and some basketball this year, or do we have to wait until next year? Well, I'm probably the least qualified sports fan, but I do appreciate that this is important to a lot of people. And uh, we want to see Americans have a chance to have some normal experiences of enjoying life. I do believe this should be possible. What RADx is doing, and appreciate the strong support uh, from this Congress uh, to make this possible, is to speedily put together these kinds of point-of-care tests that can be done on site, can give you a result within an hour, and can tell you immediately whether that person is actually infected with the SARS-CoV-2 virus, in which case they can be immediately quarantined. And I think the general sense is, for athletic teams, you really need to know that. Otherwise, you're going to have an outbreak that will wipe out the entire team. But, but your goal is to have these tests available this fall, yes. September? We, uh, That's your goal. And, and that is the goal. The path we are on right now, and again, this is a white-knuckle goal because it's never been done at yeah. anything like this kind of timetable before, would be to have an additional one million tests per day available 
uh, for the kind of uh, point of care on the spot testing that's very much needed for going back to school and going back to sports events. And these would mostly not be the tests that have to be shipped off to a lab and then come back. That is our goal. Or if they're going to be shipped to the lab, the lab needs to be very nearby. We are aware that there are places where there are labs that have instruments that could be brought to bear on this that are widely distributed already but haven't been adapted to this purpose. That would be sort of a next best thing is to have them at least in your own local arena. The best, of course, is to have your gadget right there at the front desk when somebody shows up for practice and find out, is this person somebody who's safe to send to the field? Okay, that's this fall. Now, let's go to treatments and medicine. I think Senator Kennedy may be here. He said in his inimitable way that he thinks what people are really afraid of with this virus is not just getting it, but that they might die. And they might die or have a very severe illness because there's no medicine for it except you mentioned two that have been approved by the FDA. So as we go back to school, for example, with 75,000 students going back to elementary and secondary school, we're, we're happy that, that COVID-19 doesn't seem to affect children very much or even college students very much. But there is the danger that they might infect their teachers or their older administrators or they go home to their parents or their grandparents and might infect them. Exactly. So what can you say to the teachers and the administrators and the parents and the grandparents about medicines that this fall will help them not die and not have a severe an illness? What will be available this fall when the kids go back to school? Well, there are intense efforts to expand that repertory from remdesivir and dexamethasone, which are already approved, as you mentioned, to other kinds of ways to do effective treatment. A big promise here is the use of what you might call passive immunization, where you basically provide to somebody who's ill antibodies derived from somebody who has survived already. And this is the idea behind convalescent plasma, which is being rigorously studied and right now analyzed by the FDA to see what the results have been. But even more than that, one could develop what are called monoclonal antibodies. That As is, this is so-called antibody cocktail of the kind that was developed and approved by the FDA with Ebola? Exactly. And it worked for Ebola. It worked really well. And the idea is you have these antibodies taken from somebody who has survived the disease, and you turn that into a product. And those trials are going to get started this month. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you, Senator Alexander. Senator Shaheen. Um, Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Good morning, and thank you all for being here for your testimony and for your service to try and address what is obviously the worst um, threat to Americans in my lifetime. I am particularly concerned about the impact on older Americans and those in long-term care facilities. In New Hampshire, 80 percent of our COVID-19 deaths had been in long-term care facilities. That's the highest percentage in the country. Um, I'm concerned, as you talked, Dr. Redfield, about how you prioritize who gets the vaccine when, it's, when we have one. How do you prioritize these residents and those with underlying conditions like diabetes? Thank you very much, Senator. A very, very important question. Obviously, this is going to be uh, um, discussed through our uh, advisory committee on immunization practices, but clearly the most vulnerable and those individuals that are at greater risk for mortality uh, have to be highly considered, um, as well as those individuals at great risk for infection because of what they do. Turns out among healthcare workers that get infected, uh, we've recently looked at it, uh, Turns out the most common healthcare workers that got infected were the, uh, the non-nurse, the, the sort of the caregiver mm -hmm. in the nursing home uh, were the most common there. So these are going to be critically important. I will say one thing, though. Depending on which virus vaccine is approved, it may have particular um, characteristics that make it more or less uh, appropriate to begin with in different populations. And this is why... I think it's hard for us to know exactly until we know sure. which of the viruses, but the, clearly the vulnerable are going to be, if not the top priority, one of the top priorities. And do you have a timetable for when you're going to make those decisions? Because obviously things are moving rapidly. Yeah, we're, there's discussions already going on to work frameworks for it, but as I mentioned, at the end of the day, it's going to really be dependent on the characteristic of the particular vaccine product that we're now planning to do. Um, Staying with you, Dr. Redfield, 
Um, last month, the Agency for Toxic Substances and Disease Registry issued a statement expressing concerns about the relationship between exposure to PFAS chemicals and the risk for COVID-19 infections and complications. Um, in New Hampshire and in communities across this country, we have a number of people who have been exposed to PFAS who will, are very concerned about this statement. So can you tell us what the agency is doing, what CDC is doing to assess the impact of PFAS exposure on COVID-19 risks? Yeah, we're, we're currently um, uh, working, um, both of our agency for toxic substances and our flu division are working together uh, in a study to try to learn better about the interrelationship between the PFAS serum concentrations, for example, and the association between symptomatic or asymptomatic uh, COVID infection, severity of symptoms, and hospitalization. So we do have a study ongoing to try to understand uh, that association, Senator. And do you have any timeline, again, for us for that study when you expect to have data that could give us some insights on that? I think I've, I've really learned uh, that I have to be careful in trying to predict, you know, as, as uh, my colleague uh, Dr. Collins said, uh, science has its own timeline. But are, do you think we're talking... Months, years, decades? I, I, we're not talking decades, okay? But um, obviously we're trying to get that information as soon as we can. And uh, I, I really am not able to commit how fast uh, the science will be done, Senator. Um, well, that would, it seems to me that would speak to trying to address PFAS exposure wherever we can. Um, I think this is for you, Dr. Dispro. As we're talking about the challenge in this pandemic. One of those, in testing at least, has been trying to provide access to all of the ancillary supplies that are required. Um, I think that is probably going to also be true as we think about the vaccination plan and distribution. We've heard from one manufacturer in New Hampshire who makes syringes that um, they need some certainty so they can order the equipment they're going to need to make those syringes that are going to be available for vaccinations. So can you give us any details on the anticipated timeline for the award of contracts for production and supplies? Um, sure. Thank you for that question. So as everybody knows, making a vaccine is more than just making the bulk vaccine. There are multiple steps involved. You have to have fill finish capacity. So BARDA is working very hard with our partners, the Joint Program Executive Office, uh, CBRND at DOD, as well as under OWS, uh, to uh, reserve excess capacity for fill finish so that you can not only make the vaccine, but you can fill it. We're working with JPEO to expand capacity for vials because you need the vials to put the vaccine in. Uh, we have awarded contracts for needles and syringes, acquiring needles and syringes. We're also working with JPEO to expand capacity for needles and syringes. Um, so that there are sufficient needles and syringes um, when the vaccine becomes available. So we're working on all aspects of um, the vaccine. There's also kitting. Um, when you send out a vaccine, you have to have, you know, the needles and syringes, alcohol wipes, Band-Aids, all of that. Uh, and then there's the distribution. And as Dr. Redfield mentioned earlier, it is very important that the people who are developing a vaccine and under warp speed we are, are tied in with the group that is talking about distribution and kitting because they have to know what that vaccine is gonna look like. Is it a single dose vial, a multi-dose vial? What is the cold chain requirement? Um, so we are working across Operation Warp Speed and multiple different work streams that are fully integrated. Thank, Thank you, you, Senator. Um, Senator uh, Moran. Chairman, thank you. Uh, thanks to you and the ranking member for having this hearing. Uh, gentlemen, thank you for joining us. Dr. Collins, let me first thank you for joining me on a phone call with uh, the University of Kansas Health System in which your report on a vaccine was uh, the highlight of, uh, of the day, month, and year. Uh, so I'm pleased to hear that uh, medical researchers and practitioners in Kansas heard what you said and found it to be a very pleasing, uh, kind of an optimistic note. Let me ask something that, uh, is there, is COVID-19 or is a virus so unique that there are not things that can be done to better prepare us for the next virus, the next pandemic, uh, so that a vaccine development is uh, is developed, the development occurs in a shorter period of time, or is it just starting, I don't know that scratch is the right word, but starting from scratch each time? 
That's a great question, Senator. And yes, I enjoyed uh, talking uh, to the folks in Kansas, a wonderful bunch of scientists and physicians. Uh, coronaviruses, uh, of which uh, this is one, have been around a long time. They, some of them caused the common cold, and we still haven't cured that one, but it hasn't been such a high priority. And SARS and MERS were also coronaviruses. We learned something from them. If we'd not had already an effort to try to develop vaccines for SARS and MERS, we wouldn't have been able to jump on SARS-CoV-2, this guy, quite as quickly. So every time you do this, you get a little better at it. And plus, the overall technology for how we develop vaccines has been advancing. The, the lead vaccine now, in terms of its earliest out of the, uh, the gate, which is the Moderna vaccine, and also the Pfizer one that was announced yesterday, same principle, utilizing RNA as the thing that you actually inject so that you ask the body to make the protein, which then becomes the antigen that your immune system reacts to. That's pretty new. We would not have done that 10 years ago. We wouldn't have known how. And we'll keep getting better at new ideas at that. I do hope, and maybe this is part of your question, that we learn from this experience that when we get through this, because we're going to get through this, we don't then go back into some complacency and say, well, that's it. We won't ever have another one like that again, because we all know we will. And what will it be? Will it be another coronavirus? Will it be that influenza epidemic that we've been worried we're overdue for coming out of somewhere that's actually going to be very dangerous? We, we should never again uh, step back into the point of complacency with these kinds of emerging infections. And I, I hope we will, therefore, from what has been built to deal with COVID-19, sustain that. Dr. Collins, thank you. I want to follow up on that, but I want to make sure I get a, uh, a question to Dr. Redfield. Mm. Uh, and I'll try to be back to Dr. Collins. Mm. Uh, Dr. Redfield, thank you for the telephone conversation we had several months ago. Uh, I would uh, highlight for you and others who might be listening that uh, the issue of PPE, personal protection equipment, is back front and center. Uh, it seemed to me in my life it had diminished a bit, but in a conversation with community leaders, including hospital and public health officials, uh, the concern is the supply is short once again uh, as the numbers increase and the potential of uh, a greater uh, circumstance, a more challenging circumstance comes in this fall. So any suggestions that anyone who hears this statement of mine has on how I can get additional PPE uh, to Kansas Public Health hospitals and, and employers, I, I would welcome that. But let me ask you, uh, the, the, one of the things I take away from what's transpired is the importance of the public health departments. And I think generally we have, until I served on this committee, uh, I, I, real, I didn't realize the significant role that CDC plays in support of our community and public health departments. What is it that uh, needs to take place so that when the vaccine is developed, uh, our public health departments are prepared to administer that vaccine in the, in the distribution. How can CDC, how can this committee help make certain that occurs well? Thank you very much, Senator. I think you've heard me say before, we've had decades, decades of underinvestment in our health, public health departments across this nation, and this is the time now uh, to correct that. And you all have really made great support. Uh, CDC has already um, awarded $12 billion, um, with a B, to the local, state, territorial, tribal health departments in the last eight weeks or so to begin to give them the resources they need to begin to build up their capacity. Um, you know, the human capacity usually takes longer than weeks to build up, uh, where obviously, as you know, I said CDC has over 650 people now embedded in the local health departments to help with that human capacity. Um, and we're going to continue to work with them. Uh, recently, with the resources you did with the CARES Act, uh, we were able to get uh, a little over $10 billion out for this, each of the jurisdictions to put up plans to how to do expand their testing, their contact tracing, their isolation, their public health infrastructure. So um, we're doing it on the run. I think you've heard me say before, when it comes to public health, when it comes to public health, this is something we as a nation should plan to be overprepared, not underprepared. And I do believe this is the moment in time when this nation can actually help put the public health infrastructure across this nation, not only that we need, but this nation deserves. As you mentioned, most of CDC's money actually get distributed to the local, state, territorial, tribal health departments. And some of these health departments were 70% of their overall funding. So we are the nation's funder through you of the public health infrastructure of this nation. And we need to augment that to where we're now overprepared for the next pandemic. 
Mr. Chairman, if you have a second round, I'll try to follow up with Dr. Collins. Thank you, Senator Moran. Senator Merkley. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Chairman. And, uh, and Dr. Collins, I wanted to get some sense from you of, of our understanding in a short and simple version of whether this coronavirus is such that we anticipate that its mutations will mean that different vaccines may be effective against some versions of the disease, but not others, and whether it means we will likely have to have an annual uh, production of uh, modified vaccines based on those mutations like we have with the flu. Senator, thank you. That's a very important scientific question that many of us are wrestling with, trying to collect as much data as we can. I think the somewhat reassuring news is that this particular virus, which is an RNA virus, does not have a rapid mutation rate. It's not like influenza or HIV, where you know you're going to have to have a really huff, tough time getting a vaccine to work or to stay uh, effective. But it does change over time. Uh, there is at least one significant variant uh, in the virus that's already happened since it's originally appeared about six months ago that may have made it somewhat more infectious than the original strain uh, coming out of Wuhan. We're not absolutely sure of that, but it looks like that might be the case. The good news is that those variants that we've detected do not seem to be those that would interfere with the effectiveness of the current vaccines that are being designed and tested, nor with the monoclonal antibody strategies that are also being tempted. But we're going to watch that very carefully. And a big question we will all have is whether this is a circumstance where once vaccinated, uh, you are basically protected for life, or whether over the course of time, this virus will change its coat enough that you will need to have a booster that's slightly better in its design for whatever it is that this turns into next. We don't know the answer to that, but I think the good news is this is not like HIV, this is not like influenza. It's a fairly well-behaved virus that we think we ought to be able to tackle effectively with a vaccine strategy. Thank you very much, Doctor. And I want to turn to uh, the question that the Senator Murray raised about the elimination of the buy dole safeguards. Those <laughs> safeguards uh, for reasonable pricing when the government has invested in the development have never been implemented, but many people feel they serve as an effective instrument of leverage should be, the American people be gouged after investing millions or now perhaps billions of, of dollars. Was NIH consulted about removing the buy dole safeguards from the contracts? We were not asked about that. We've been asked about those safeguards in other circumstances. Do you support inclusion of those safeguards to protect the American people from price gouging after we in invest in the development of drugs? I certainly think the American people ought to have access to vaccines that they're helping to pay for, and I think the plan has been nicely made to be sure that that is the case so that nobody would be denied access to this regardless of their health care coverage. The March in Rights issue actually are rather complicated. When you look at the original language of Bayh-Dole, it does seem, as Dr. Dispro said earlier, that these were intended to try to allow the government to step in when there was a company that basically refused to try to produce a product that would benefit the public. It does not look as if those particular parts of the bill were intended to do something where the price was considered to be unacceptable. We've been caught in this many times before, and that's what the lawyers tell me. So in this circumstance, I have to defer to BARDA in terms of why the decision was made, but my understanding was there was really no likelihood that the product wasn't going to be pursued, in which case March in rights would be a tough thing to try to apply. In which case it would be okay to leave them in the contract. Moderna contract still has those March in rights, and NIH claims joint ownership of the Mo uh, Moderna vaccine. So I find it interesting that NIH wasn't consulted over the difference between that contract and some of these other contracts. I have to be careful here because it's possible somebody at NIH was consulted, but I was not made aware of it. So uh, I I'll have to check on that and see if there was a consultation. Yeah, thank you. And Dr. Uh, Redfield, uh, was the CDC consulted over the uh, elimination of this contract language in, in designed to ensure uh, fair pricing? Not to my knowledge, sir. Okay, thank you. And um, uh, Dr. Uh, Disbrow, um, why suddenly eliminate this language in some of these contracts but not 
others. Who was it who asked you to, to do this? And why did you include the language in some contracts and, and not others? So I think some of the confusion is that in, in our FAR based contracts, it is in there. Some of the documents that were requested by the group that asked for them under FOIA, Freedom of Information Act, were other transactional agreements, which are outside of the um, FAR. And also to remember that these are research and development contracts. We are not acquiring product under these contracts. Well, recognize too that it's research and development being funded by the American people with a vast potential for profit for the companies. So the American people have a, a stake in fair pricing. I think uh, the American people are, are aware that they are gouged on drugs routinely, that we pay more than citizens in any other developed country. 80% of Americans routinely respond they want fair pricing, that they shouldn't be charged more than the citizens of other countries, especially because we spend more on the development of the products. And I think that plays double here. The reason I'm emphasizing this is we're going to spend billions of dollars in this development, and we should absolutely use that investment to make sure that we're not gouged on the, on the back end. And so I just want to say that this conversation that Murray initiated and I'm following up on here is an important one. And I hope you're going to take full and thoughtful consideration of how, how to make sure that Americans do not pay more for these drugs uh, through the government uh, payments or through citizens having to pay for them than do the citizens of any other developed country. In fact, uh, I hope you'll pledge to make sure that that's the case. Thank you, Senator Merkley. If you want to come back for a second round, you can. Senator Capito. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you all for not just being here today. I know you've been on Capitol Hill many times, but thank you for what you've done and what you're going to do uh, to, to meet this crisis. Uh, Dr. Disbrow, I have a question. Many of my questions that I had initially have sort of you all have answered on the safety and, and efficacy uh, issues around a vaccine. But as I recall back when we first started, uh, we had an issue with China making the PPE, with Italy having the swabs. I might have this a little wrong, but the reagents in Germany. And there was a competition globally for all of these supplies. I imagine that there's going to be a competition globally for the vaccine supplies and the vaccine itself. Um, Dr. Collins mentioned that they, they have been working with the UK in a collaborative way. But how much of what you're seeing the development in is actually manufactured in this country where we can sort of con control our own destiny? Sure, thank you for the question. And it's a very important question. This global pandemic has highlighted the vulnerability in our supply chains for medical devices, raw materials, and active pharmaceutical ingredients for drugs. I, I can't give you the specific number of, of what percent of the products are manufactured here in the United States, but what we are doing as I mentioned, uh, uh, responded to one of the earlier questions, is we are uh, working for needles and syringes and vials to right. expand domestic capacity uh, so that we don't have to worry about this uh, in the future, in immediate future or in the near future. Um, we are also working with all of our manufacturers to make sure they acquire the raw materials that are needed to manufacture vaccines and or therapeutics, because don't forget therapeutics uh, right. are also important, um, so that they can manufacture at scale. Um, is this a question that you ask when you're uh, looking at uh, g giving contracts, whether it's uh, produced in the United States where you can control your own destiny? So we look at their raw supply material chain. We do that for all of our manufacturers to identify risk early on and try to address those risks very early on. Well, I'd like to dig down on that because I think, uh, you know, I think that that's concerning, I think, obviously, because this is a global issue, but also I think it's sort of... Um, shook the American public when we realized we weren't really controlling uh, the ability to have testing supplies or the ability to produce our own PPE. Um, Dr. Collins, a question I have that's a little off, uh, off topic, but equally as important. Um, you know that uh, NIH has invested heavily, and so, so have we here on the uh, opioid epidemic, but the latest uh, st stats coming out of our state of West Virginia, Senator Manchin's here, and uh, and across the country is that there has been a big spike in overdoses during this COVID and uh, epidemic. And I'm wondering, um, I, I know you're fast at work on this in a lot of different various ways, but how are you seeing that and how might having a vaccine or having better therapeutics be able to help us meet this challenge of 
folks that are in therapy for addiction or have this addiction issue to be able to cope during these very stressful times. Senator, I really appreciate your bringing this up, and it's not off topic at all. It's a really serious national tragedy that has now gotten even worse because of the coalescence of the COVID-19 crisis and the opioid use disorder crisis. And I've seen those same statistics about maybe a 42% increase in overdose de uh, overdoses in just the last three months and deaths associated with that are going up. After we had started to make some headway uh, with this crisis, right. with all of the things that had been done with various programs and use of medications that we know can work, and yet now prescriptions for those medications have plummeted because people aren't able to get into treatment programs. Uh, we are doing everything we can at NIH with supplements to some of our research programs to try to understand how best to intervene, how to provide people with support, even if it has to be done remotely by telemedicine kinds of interventions. We've been supporting the idea that methadone, which traditionally required people to show up every day in a crowded lo location, could actually be done in a fashion where people could receive this at home because otherwise the dangers are too great and people were simply dropping out. But I can't tell you how desperately we need to get back in a place where people can congregate together. And that will require, of course, effective treatments and vaccines, and that's on my mind every day as we're trying to accelerate that progress. This is a very serious situation indeed. It, it is, and anecdotally, I heard that really the, the counseling that was going on by telehealth initially uh, was actually having greater, um, uh, they were staying more true to their appointments and it was going well, and then it just has gone back down. People need interaction right. more than just through a Zoom call, and that's hard to do right now. All right. Um, Dr. Redfield, I have four seconds. Um, our vaccination rate in West Virginia is falling. How are we going to do a PR campaign to say the vaccination for this is important and other vaccinations? Yeah, it's a critical point, Senator. And I always look at the consequences of COVID, as the Secretary said, health versus health. 85% decline in pediatric vaccinations what? for individuals under five. Uh, we're obviously going to, we're in the process of making a, a play with the American Academy of Pediatrics and throughout the to really respond to that. It's really, really important. Globally, it's a big issue too. I've tried to say in Sub-Saharan Africa, whereas COVID's now a significant problem, but a much bi bigger problem is there's 120 million children now who haven't gotten measles vaccine. Right. And Thank measles you. is gonna have significant mortality in Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Senator, uh, Senator Baldwin. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, I have a couple of, I hope, uh, quick questions. Um, Dr. Disbro, can you uh, just quickly list for me the, uh, the vaccine uh, prospects that are being invested in right now? You know, you've narrowed it from many, many, uh, many uh, who have come forward to, I think it was first 14 and now fewer. Um, can you just list those for me and what type of vaccine uh, it is? So I appreciate so, the question, Senator. I cannot um, specifically mention some of the companies. We're in active negotiations with many of them. One that I can mention uh, is AstraZeneca, uh, where we already have a very large uh, contract that covers both advanced research and development and procurement. Uh, we are in the process of moving forward with large manufacturing contracts and acquisition of the vaccine for multiple other candidates. Uh, so your your those uh, company names uh, in terms of the vaccine prospects are not public. So some of the companies that were originally funded by BARDA for advanced research and development, um, those are public. Uh, who we've invested in, I think your specific question may be the uh, composition of the portfolio under Operation Warp Speed. That I cannot uh, today talk about, but we are very quickly um, moving and uh, negotiating contracts, and hopefully in the very near future, uh, we will be able to make an announcement with the entire portfolio under Operation Warp Speed. How many have been finalized right now versus how many are you still in negotiations with? <laughs> so I already told you about the one, which is the AstraZeneca, uh, and we have multiple other candidates that we're working with. And how many do you think you'll have in total? <laughs> More than one. Uh, sorry, I'm, it just, it, it really is procurement sensitive. These are market moving negotiations that we're having with these companies. 
Um, you know, so I just need to be very careful about that. But again, um, we are happy to uh, publicly announce. You will see the press releases when we uh, award these contracts so that everybody is aware of, of what's being supported. So you have the, uh, the intellectual property of uh, Prospect. You also have the manufacturing. You want to make sure to fit timelines that you'll be able to have uh, 